Welcome everyone. My name is Jill Ford and I serve as our Assistant Dean for Student Success at the Clessey College of Engineering and Integrated Design at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And we are just so happy that we have this opportunity to partner with the D. Howard International Education Foundation on the Rural STEM Initiative. Our fearless leader um, with D. Howard is uh, Mr. Wayne Fagan, who's not able to be here with us today. So I'm happy to give the the welcome um, on behalf of both UTSA and D. Howard International Education Foundation. And we're so excited to have Frankfurt Elementary with us. Uh, Frankfurt is near and dear to my heart as myself being a graduate of Bowling Green Elementary and then later on Bowling Green High School. Um, so, so happy uh, that we could have you as part of this initiative. Uh, and so a big thank you to Principal Bird for participating with us and uh, helping to arrange to have all of you wonderful kiddos in the room and hi, how are you all doing? So good to see you all here. We're excited to have you and really excited um, to have Dr. Xu with us and the Aerospace Corporation. So with that, I will turn it over to Carlos. All right, thank you, thank you, Jill. Um, yeah, so for today, uh, just to give you all a quick rundown of the format. So we'll have a presentation from Dr. Shu, and uh, during the middle of that, we'll we'll take a quick break for any questions. Um, so if you do have any questions, think about them uh, as as the presentation goes on. Um, and then once we do break, you can either put some questions in the chat, or uh, we can have students come up to the front and ask some questions. So we'll do that at the midpoint, and then we'll do that at, again at the end in case you didn't um, get to get your question answered earlier on down the line. Um, and so we'll have plenty of time for questions. So um, feel free to think of as many interesting questions, or if there's anything you you would like to know or, or learn more about, feel free to 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 think of anything that you'd like to to dig deeper on as as we go through the presentation. Um, and so with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And so um, the presentation, our, our our main host today is going to be uh, Dr. Andrea Shu uh, from the who's a senior scientist uh, from Propulsion Science Department at the Aerospace Corporation. And so I'll pass it over to her to introduce herself and go ahead and get everything started. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Can everybody hear me okay? All right. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Andrea Shu. Um, you guys can call me Andrea or Dr. Shu, whatever you would like. <clears throat> I go by Andrea here at work, so I'm very used to everybody's calling me Andrea. Um, I am with the Aerospace Corporation. We are a nonprofit uh, corporation based out of Los Angeles, California. We have another office over on the East Coast, also near Washington, D.C. Um, we're a company of about 4,000 people, um, about a third of that. So about 1,000 to 2,000 people are um, scientists uh, and engineers. And so uh, for myself, I got my undergrad degree in engineering. I'm a chemical engineer. And I got my graduate degree in chemistry. And I have been at aerospace for 12 years. And so um, if you guys have any questions on what it's like being a scientist here or just in general or what I do, um, we can we can talk about that. So I'm going to give you a brief about 10 minute uh, presentation on what I do here at Aerospace, what my day job is. So let's go ahead and start on that. Uh, I am in the propulsion department of the Aerospace Corporation, and you can see me there. I'm standing in front of one of our very large vacuum chambers. And we'll talk about why we need vacuum chambers in just a moment. So let's go ahead. Okay, so like I mentioned, I work in the propulsion department. Um, how many people know what propulsion might be? Got a guess, raise your hands. Okay, got a couple of people. Okay, great. Propulsion is just a fancy way of saying getting something to go. So, you know, if you're riding your bike and you're pushing the pedals, you are the propulsion, you're causing it to move forward, right? And so um, when we're in space or when we're on the ground trying to get into space, we need propulsion to give us that pushing force. It's what gets us off the earth and it's also what moves us around in space. So there's two steps to propulsion getting you into space. There's first, you gotta get off the ground, right? And so this is a picture of the space shuttle. You guys have probably seen it before. It's got that bright orange core to it. And this is what we call a chemical propulsion device. It operates from combustion, which is just a fancy word of um, a fancy way of saying it burns um, like a candle. So it burns for a very short period of time, just a, you know, a couple of minutes at a very high thrust level. And thrust is how we refer to the amount of force. 
So you can think of it as being a really short burst of a lot of force. You need that to get off of the ground because you're fighting against gravity. Um, and once we get into space, that picture on the right there is looking at a satellite that's moving around right outside of the Earth. Um, it's in orbit around the Earth. So basically, when you're in space, there's no gravity anymore, right? And so you don't need a lot of force to get you around. And so in space, the thrust levels are very low. So instead of being, you know, millions of pounds of force to get off the ground, in space, you really only need force that's equivalent to the weight of a quarter in your hand. So it's very, very light. You could just push it. If you were in space, you could push it with your hand. Um, and you can move a long way because there's nothing slowing you down, basically. So you just keep going. Let's keep moving along. Okay, next slide. This is a video showing some of the testing that we're doing at the Aerospace Corporation. So you're going to see a rocket being fired here. So that's an example of the type of testing that we do here at aerospace um, in our laboratories. That what you just saw there was a chemical combustion um, event, right? So it was a it was a pretty high force, high thrust rocket, and we do um, various types of testing. So we're interested in studying uh, what types of fuels burn more efficiently, and we're also interested in measuring the thrust, the force that comes out of these various types of rockets. And we also build the instrumentation that goes with testing them. So things like measuring the temperature of the combustion chamber, um, looking at um, various ways of imaging the plume, for example. And we also look at things like green propellants and future, future propellants um, that might be easier on our fossil fuel reserves. OK, let's go to the next slide. OK, so this is now moving from chemical to in space. So this is electric propulsion now. Um, and in order to test things that are going to be in space uh, here on Earth, um, it, it gets a little bit complicated. So the, the primary thing that we need to do is remove all the air from the test chambers in order to make it like space. So we can remove all the air by using these big vacuum chambers, as you see here. We, some, we have some really huge vacuum chambers at aerospace. And the reason why they have to be so big is because space is so big. And so in order to simulate or a, a closely simulate conditions in space, the bigger the chamber is, the closer we can get to the conditions that you would actually see in space so that you could get a more realistic test. Um, so you can see our, our two managers there standing next to the really big vacuum chamber that we have. That's a 14-foot vacuum chamber. That's our newest vacuum chamber. We got that a couple years ago. And we've been using that to test some really large deep space missions for uh, places like NASA, for example. They come in to test their engines here at aerospace. Um, so of course, we can remove the air from the chamber, but we can't remove the gravity. Um, gravity is still going to be there. So although the air is gone, the gravity is still around. So that is just one thing that we have to we have to live with. Um, there's no way for us to test an anti-gravity chamber here at aerospace. So we make accommodations for it. Let's go forward. Yeah. So one of the things I do is I work in small satellites. Um, so you might ask, how small is small? Um, our large satellites are pretty large. So you can see there at the top there, uh, a thousand kilograms is giving you the idea of it's about the size of a rhino. Um, all the way down to you can see a nano satellite there is quite small. Um, it can be on the order of one to 10 kilograms, which is about 20 pounds or so. And it's showing you the size of a cat or a duck. It's something that you can actually hold in your hand. Uh, I would like to show you guys. So I've got 
Sorry, I'm going to pop off camera here. Um, I've got a model of a satellite here in my office. This is what we call a CubeSat. And you can see it's quite small. And this is the size of the satellite that we would actually launch. So it's not a miniature. This is the actual size. And you can see, so these little black rectangles here are solar cells. Um, it's got a little GPS unit uh, like you would have on your phone so we can track this thing in space. Um, it's got some radios for communication. And this is what's called a sun sensor. It's a series of very tiny little uh, cameras that work to position the satellite by looking for the sun and pointing it towards the sun, in other words. Um, it's even got some propulsion, which is what I was primarily interested in. These are, these are little engines. So look how tiny they are. They are about one inch square, right? Or one inch cubed. And there are eight of those on the end there. So the satellite has the capability to move around in space, to position itself, and to be able to do a couple of really interesting missions. Um, and this is really pretty cool that we can launch something that size and have it be able to do all of those, those neat little missions. Okay, let's move forward. Okay, so I'm showing here a couple of things that small satellites can do. Um, we are moving into a realm of smaller and smaller satellites. So, um, you know, it used to be that the government would launch billion dollar satellites that were the size of a car. Um, and we would launch one of them. Uh, now we're realizing that it's really advantageous to have, uh, for example, a fleet of smaller satellites. Um, and you can do a lot of really interesting things with them. So the one, the picture there on the right is a picture of a small satellite moving a damaged satellite. So these satellites, they don't live forever, right? So they get into space, they have a lifespan of about 10 to 20 years at most. Uh, and then their, their equipment starts to break down from radiation. Um, they might use up all their propellants so they can't move anymore. Uh, they eventually sort of die in space. And so, or, or they can become damaged and hit other things. And so a small satellite could, for example, move it into a safer space where it would be out of the way uh, and it wouldn't collide with other satellites. It can also inspect a larger satellite. So the picture there on the left is showing you a little satellite, you know, looking at a bigger satellite to figure out what was wrong with it. Um, maybe it hit a little piece of space debris or a piece of its insulation fell off, for example. So these are little inspection satellites, for example. Um, and then um, maybe the most powerful thing small satellites can do is they can set up a network. So you guys are familiar with um, like bees in a beehive. So, you know, one bee doesn't, doesn't do a lot whole, doesn't do a whole lot by itself, but if you had a whole hive of bees, they can talk to each other. They can tell each other where the food is. They can communicate with each other, right? So if you had a whole hive of small satellites set up around the earth, we could pass information between the satellites really, really quickly uh, and get that information exactly to where we need it. Um, and that's that's pretty powerful that um, instead of waiting for the satellite to come all the way around, you can now instantly figure out what's going on anywhere. Let's go forward. Yeah. So this leads into what's happening with small satellites now. Um, you guys might have heard of Starlink. Uh, it's being launched by SpaceX. Um, Amazon is launching a whole constellation called Kuiper pretty soon. These are gonna be thousands of satellites, right? And they are thousands of small satellites. And the idea is uh, information. So having all of these small satellites spread out everywhere, we will have internet coverage for, for everyone in the world, um, even over rural areas or uh, underdeveloped areas where they might not currently have internet service. So that is one of the cool things that's happening in the world of small satellites. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, and that's me. Um, I am happy to be here. I, I will answer any questions you guys have. Um, and uh, then I've got a couple more charts, but I'd like to pause here and just give a couple of minutes in case anyone has comments or questions. 
Yeah. So if anybody, so from the class, if you'd like to have somebody either come to the front and ask the question themselves, or if you'd like to take questions and ask them to the camera or type them in the chat, however you'd like to do it, Frankfurt, uh, um, it's up to you all. Yeah, we'll have them come up here. So teachers, if you want to call on a couple of your students. Let's start with Benson, did you have a question? All right, come on up. So you can probably stand right there and hopefully they'll be able to hear you. If you can't hear him, let me know and I'll have him uh, go. Sounds good. How long, how long is the longest uh, a satellite has to live? What was the last part of that? So how long has a satellite, what was the last part? How long has the longest satellite lived? lived? Oh, how long has it lived? Um, Most satellites are designed to live about 20 to 25 years. That's called their lifespan. Uh, many of the NASA satellites actually live much longer than that. Um, we've got a couple that are probably in the decades, so multiple decades. Um, eventually, their technology gets too old and they, they might not die, but we stop servicing them, in other words. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Brian? Have satellites ever gone into the sun? Have satellites ever gotten to the sun? Is that your question? I don't think they have gone into the sun. They have gotten close to the sun. Um, there was close recently a, yeah, there was recently a mission called Osiris Rex. Have you guys heard of it? It it was it made news because they sent it out to an asteroid, and they uh, collected a sample of the asteroid and dropped it off at Earth. This was just like two weeks ago. It was pretty amazing, and they retrieved the the asteroid sample, and then the satellite itself is going to. Uh, go on and um, circle around the sun kind of indefinitely. Um, and that's the end mission for it. I don't think it's going to go into the sun, but I think it's going to orbit around the sun. <laughs> that's cool. Thank, you. Thank you. All right, Cooper has a question. Oh, what happened? What if like the tiny uh, satellite like gets like damaged while moving to, uh, one of the big satellites? I heard is what if a little satellite gets damaged by a big satellite? Is that your question? Well, it's moving a satellite by like a like an asteroid or something. So what if a small satellite gets damaged while moving another satellite? Oh yeah, that that can happen. Um, so there there is um, we're really concerned as scientists about a ring of of space debris that's around the Earth. Um, it's basically space trash it's it's sort of sad and there's just all this trash circulating the world um and it is it is a problem it hits satellites pretty frequently and it can cause damage and so if your satellite either big or small if it gets hit by a piece of, of debris or a, a micro asteroid or something like that um it can damage its solar cells and battery and all sorts of things um satellites usually can predict when that happens and so scientists have put a lot of effort into tracking this space trash um, we track every piece that we know about there are like thousands of pieces up there and so nasa has a database of where each piece is so that when a satellite thinks it's about to crash into one it can use its propulsion system to get out of the way um, that is true for most of the bigger trash there's a lot of little trash up there that, you know, is like one centimeter um, sized stuff that we can't really track very well. And so that certainly can damage your satellite, but we try to move out of the way of the bigger pieces. <laughs> All right, Jackson has our next question. How much like little satellites do you send up into space? I'm sorry, I couldn't. How, how much little satellites do you send up to space at a time? How many can you send up at a time? Is that the question? Yeah. 
you can send a lot of them up at a time. Um, the last NASA mission, Artemis mission, sent up, I think, 100 plus small satellites. Um, they were small, so they're about, you know, this, this size. You can pack a lot of these into one rocket. And it really depends on the size of the satellite. So we still do launch big satellites. And depending on who the customer is also, we might launch one at a time for those because they are very specialized. Um, and they might be going to a very special orbit. Um, for the ones that are going for science missions, for example, we, we often put in up to 100 satellites on one launch, so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have Jaylen with another question. Have you ever worked with NASA? Yes, the Aerospace Corporation does work with NASA. Um, we have a few dozen people down in Houston working for for the NASA Glenn uh, program um, and we do various other studies with NASA too like um, human studies in space uh, microgravity um, and uh, I'll, I'll actually talk about one of the studies that we're doing here that is sort of interesting in a couple of couple of minutes do we yeah. want to take maybe one more question and then yeah, we'll move that, on to yeah so say we have one question do any of the girls have questions yeah maybe one more from a girl and then we'll we'll have time for questions at the end Allie, you have a question? Come on up. Yay. How long does it take for one of those satellites to come go closer? Up? Allie, come closer and talk right to here. How long does it take for one of those satellites to go up? How long does it take? Um, the actual going up only takes about five minutes. So it is so fast. Um, the chemical part of the propulsion, which is what gets you off the ground, is really, really quick and it needs to be fast because otherwise you come back down due to gravity. So you got to get out to space really fast. And then once you're out at space, you have time to get to the correct orbit and we call that orbit circularization. That part can take days or so, um, but during that time, you're just sort of making very small corrections to your path. Uh, so the whole thing takes, you know, it can take um, oh, up to a week or so but the actual launch part is very, very quick. Cool. Thank you. All right, yeah, th thank you all for the questions. Again, remember, so if we'll have more time for questions at the end. So if we didn't get it to it now, we'll, we'll have some more time at the end. Or um, we're going to have a, a introduce a ton of new stuff as well. So um, hopefully you uh, have some new questions as we, we get to this next part. Right. Awesome. OK. Thank you. thank you, Carlos. OK, so my next section of the talk is called the smallest of the small. Um, so like I said, I work in small satellites, but besides small satellites, we work in other very tiny things. Um, how many people know what a, a tardigrade is? It's also called a water bear. Anybody? I don't see any hands. Okay, awesome. Okay. Well, I work on a little animal called the tardigrade. Let's go forward. And I think this is a short video introducing what a tardigrade is. Water bears live from the deepest ocean trenches to the tops of mountains, from tropical rainforests to the Antarctic. They're short and plump with four pairs of legs. They move slowly in a lumbering gait like a bear, which is why they're called water bears. Their scientific name is tardigrade, which means slow walker. Adult water bears are typically 500 microns to one millimeter long. Their favorite food is moss, and they're most commonly found in streams, rivers, or ponds. What's amazing about water bears is their resilience. They can survive pressures up to 600 megapascals, six times that of the deepest ocean trenches. They can also survive radiation hundreds of times the dosage that would kill a human, without food or water, at temperatures down to minus 458 degrees Fahrenheit or beyond boiling. Perhaps most amazingly, they can survive the vacuum of space. How do they do this? By going into a hibernation state, they replace the water in their cells with a glassy resin, which preserves them and their DNA even from space radiation. In this state, their metabolism is suspended and they can go without food or water for more than 30 years. Understanding how these remarkable creatures function can help us understand human factors and habitability for space exploration. Did you know that there may already be water bears in space? On April 11, 2018, the Israeli satellite Bereshit planned to land on the moon. It carried with it a backup of planet Earth, including thousands of tardigrades. The satellite crash landed, spilling tardigrades all over the lunar surface. 
I wonder if they survived. Here at Aerospace, we're doing our own experiments to explore how these amazing creatures survive in vacuum. How are we doing this? Well, we can create a space-like vacuum in one of our small chambers by removing all the air after we've added some water bears inside. We expect to see the water bears in vacuum go into their dormant cocoon-like state. This is called a ton, and they can remain in this state as long as they are exposed to vacuum. When the air is returned to the chamber, we expect them to return to their original bear-like form. At Aerospace, we have several samples of water bears, and they are living happily in the Propulsion Science Laboratories under the care of Dr. Andrea Shu. We'll be keeping you posted with their latest news. <laughs> okay, great. You can actually see, I don't know if you can see behind me, all right, next to this satellite here. <laughs> um, so this, this is the tank that they were living in, and you can see kind of my microscope here next to it. And I think they're probably still in there. I haven't checked on them in a little while, but they are very hardy little animals. So I wouldn't be surprised if there are still couples still in there. Um, I'm holding up a little, a little jar of them. Um, okay, let's go on to the next slide. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so one of the reasons why we're interested in tardigrades is they are extremely hardy. So the video had mentioned that they it's very hard to kill them. Uh, they live everywhere on the earth. There are about a thousand species of them. Um, they live everywhere from the very hot volcanic vents in our ocean all the way into the Arctic zones. Um, and they eat, they're, they're vegetarian, so they eat algae and moss to survive. Um, and I'm showing you a couple of pictures there of little tardigrades underneath our microscope that were in our aquarium. And I think on the next slide there are some really cool little close-ups. Okay, so, and this might be a video. Let's see if we can play it. So you, in this video, you can see them moving around. They're so interesting because their little bodies are see-through. You can see that they look like little little worms. Um, they have eight legs, which is why they're called, you know, they, they lumber about and they look like a little bear. You can see the moss in their belly. So you see that one on the, on the right there with that little strip of green in its body. That is moss that it just ate. Um, so it's really funny that you can see them all day just kind of roaming around and eating moss. Um, you can also see their little eyes. I don't know if you can see that they have little black eyes that are visible. And then, yeah, right there, right there. Uh, and they are, they're adorable. They live for several months and then they, uh, they reproduce. And I think on the next video, there is, uh, there's some pictures of their eggs. Yeah, here we go. So this was a really cool capture of an egg sac. Um, and you can see that little... Uh, the circled area there, maybe it'll come back into focus. Okay, that's that's one of the tardigrades sort of looking at the egg sac. I think at the end it'll come back. But what happens is the, uh, the tardigrades, the females, well, actually all tardigrades, shed their exoskeletons. So they're, they're a little bit like crabs in that when they grow, they shed their shells. And so they leave their shells behind and then they grow a bigger shell as they get larger and then the females will actually lay their eggs inside of their old shells and so what you see there in that set of three eggs that is actually inside of an exoskeleton of a tardigrade that has then gone somewhere else it's it's grown bigger okay let's keep going okay so we did in our lab a couple of experiments, including uh, cooling them um, to see if they would go into their ton state. We also uh, dehydrated them. Um, we also pumped them down, so we exposed them to vacuum. And then because at Aerospace, we have very specialized labs, we even had one of the labs irradiate them with um, radiation that you might see in space. Um, and all of us to understand you know, how they survive in space. Uh, and the thought is to try to understand why they are, what makes them so hardy. Um, we, we did find that they are extremely resilient to radiation and to vacuum, uh, which is interesting for us because that's basically uh, 
what is in space. So if we can understand that, um, we can we can try to understand how to apply that towards you know human spacesuits, for example, to better protect our, ourselves from radiation. Um, yeah, that's kind of an interesting picture of them drying out. Yeah, so in space they go into this uh, this kind of this hibernation state called a ton state, and then they can come back out of it, which is really interesting too. Okay, we can go on to the next slide. Okay, and that's that's really it. So that gives you kind of an overview of what I do here. Um, if anyone has any questions, I will take those now. I see. Wow. All right, perfect. Uh, thank you for, for that great presentation, Dr. Shu. Uh, so yeah, uh, we have some people already ready for questions. They're eager and ready to go. Um, yeah, so go ahead and feel free to come to the front and ask any questions you have. Uh, how long, uh, or how do you guys get the satellites up into the space? How do we get into how do we get them into space? That's a good question. So there's a long process for getting things into space. Um, it's really hard, although it's getting easier. Uh, I think what what most companies have to do is they have to find a launch. So that is um, a vehicle that's willing to launch them. So not not everybody can launch something into space, at least not yet. Um, so you have to find a launch and then you got to pay for it. Uh, right now, I think it's about a million dollars a launch. That price is really dropping. Um, and then once you're kind of set up for the launch, you ship your satellite to the launch site. And it can sometimes sit at the launch site for months and months, um, you know, up to one year, depending on who else is on that satellite and whether they have any delays due to weather and that sort of thing. But it roughly takes, I would say, six months to one year to get your thing into space. Um, and then I think um, someone else had asked how long it takes to launch something in this space. The launching process is very quick. It, it takes just a few days to a week or so. Thank you. Um, what happens when you're in the air vacuum or just what happens with the air vacuum? What happens with the air vacuum? Do you mean in space or on the ground? Um, on the ground. On the ground, what happens in our vacuum chambers, you mean? Yes. Ah, okay. So we, we have a really large pumping system. It's, it's like the size of a building. So what you guys saw pictures of were the chambers themselves. Um, that's sort of the glamorous part of the testing. Behind that chamber is a set of pumps that is the size of an entire building that pumps all the air out of those chambers. And it takes a day, sometimes two days to do that. Um, so you have to make sure all of the air is out or as much as we can get out. We, of course, can't get all of the air out because the chambers leak. They, they might have some tiny little leaks, but we, we do the best we can. Um, but yeah, that's the process. And then the chamber has to be strong enough to withstand vacuum, right? Um, and, and then we we put all our things into it before we start pumping down so that once it's it's evacuated, uh, we run our tests, whatever we need to do, and then we can vent back up, which means allow the air back into it. Thank you. Bailey has a question. How long do tardigrades live? Tardigrades, um, it depends on the species, but most of them live a couple of months or so. I think a couple of months up to one year is about to. What is the closest you have gotten to a black hole? I have not left Earth. <laughs> I think um, I am not sure I know the answer to that question. Um, I think people have kind of stumbled onto black holes, but I don't think anyone's really gone anywhere close to one, or at least not anybody that has come back and told us about it. <laughs> Where did you get your water bears? Where do I get my water bears? Was that the question? Yeah. Yeah, you can actually buy water bears online. 
Um, you can also buy them at um, some aquarium stores. So you might ask around if you're interested in, in purchasing some of your own. They're, they're totally safe and um, you know they're, they're a great little pet. They, and they actually will breed inside of your aquarium. So if you get a couple, they might last for quite a, quite a long time if you take care of them. Um, yeah, so I order mine online, but some people will actually go out into uh, streams and ponds. They very commonly live where there is a pool of algae. So uh, if you guys have access to that, I would encourage you to go look and see if you can find any. Um, you might be able to just see them with a pretty um, regular microscope. It needs to be about 50 times magnification. But you can get uh, microscopes that snap onto your phones now that allow you to get that level of magnifications. It's really amazing. Um, so you can actually go searching for tiny grades on, on your own if you want. See what species you find. Thank you. Mm. Oh, you already have the questions? What was your bi biggest uh, satellite? Our biggest satellite? Um, we have some government customers that launch satellites as big as a school bus. It's pretty large. So on something like that, you would only launch one satellite per launch, right? So that would be your only thing that you launch that one time, but they are huge. They'll be thousands of pounds. So it's giant. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Brock with a question. Do water bears just eat algae? Yeah, they just eat algae. They're, they're totally vegetarian. Mm -hmm. They're actually pretty picky about their algae, too. <laughs> not, not just any algae will do. <laughs> All right, Brylin has a question. Do you have a moon rock? I don't have a moon rock. That would be so cool. <laughs> Emma has a question. Oh. Um, what happens if a water bear doesn't do like get in its cocoon? Oh, if it doesn't get in its cocoon. So it is possible that if we cool it too fast, um, that it doesn't have a chance to, to get into its cocoon phase. And if that happens, it unfortunately dies. So we, we did have a couple of incidents where, um, you know, in the wild, for example, when the the uh, the water bear goes into this ton state, this hibernation state, it's usually very slow. Like picture a pond that very slowly sort of dries up over an entire season, right? And, and it could be like months of very slowly drying it so that it has a chance to build this this ton around itself. Um, if it's too fast, it can't it can't do it. It won't be able to survive. Okay. Yeah. How hot can a satellite be without melting? How hot? Um, boy, that depends on what it's made out of. Satellites are designed to get pretty warm because in space, um, we don't have an atmosphere to protect us from the sun. And so um, when the satellite is in the sun, it's directly just exposed to the sun's rays. And it can get, I mean, up to a couple hundred degrees or so. So hotter than boiling water. It can get quite hot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's a question that I have to ask one before I call on people who have. All right, Justin, come on. Anybody else that has a question who has not asked? How hot is the sun? <laughs> How hot is the th sun? I think thousands of degrees. You have to check me on that. <laughs> Very hot. Hot enough to melt any satellite. <laughs> Has there ever been a uh, uh, satellite that has been lost in space? Yes, yes. That actually happens more often than you think. Um, that is part of the reason why we have this, uh, we call it the space debris belt around, around the Earth. There's a lot of trash out there. And most of that trash is satellites that are lost. And so we can no longer control them. We don't know where they're at anymore. Uh, we can't really track them. Um, so yes, there are a lot of satellites that are lost in space. There, there are a few that are lost in deep space, but I think that is um, on purpose. For example, we've sent them out there for exploration and we never intend to bring them back. Um, so they're just, they're just going as deep as they can. They'll send back information 
until until they can't anymore. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And yeah, we had an answer to the how, how hot the sun is. So you basically had it right. Yeah. Um, the surface of the sun is 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So 10,000 degrees. Okay. <laughs> so if we think 100 yeah. degrees is hot, <laughs> try <Ooh>. 10,000. <000. laughs> we don't have any materials here on Earth that can withstand that, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, are you guys planning to make a lot more uh, water bears? Yeah, I mean, we will keep them for as long as they're alive. Um, I don't know if we'll buy any more. Um, but yeah, they certainly just will reproduce, I think. Very easy to keep around. How much kind of species do you have of water bears? How many? Say that again. How much different kinds of species do you have? Oh, uh, a single species. So since I got mine online, um, they tell you exactly what species you get and which strain you get. Um, if you collect them in the wild, they'll be they'll probably be something different. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever seen like weird things in space uh, from a satellite from the cameras? Oh, yes, we see weird things all the time. <laughs> um, because we can't accurately test, you know, like I mentioned, we can remove the air from our test chambers, but we can't remove the gravity. Um, there's other things that we can't quite test for. For example, we um, we don't have the capability to really irradiate our satellites. Um, radiation, there's a lot of space radiation. So once we launch the satellites, um, strange things can still happen, of course, that we can't uh, account for on the ground. And so we see things like uh, radiation effects on electronics, um, strange heating, uh, all the time. It's, it's very common. And um, what's important is that the satellite continues to communicate with us so that we can still get data from it. And then we can troubleshoot from here on Earth. This is how we, we usually do it. And we're going to take let's say two more questions so okay a couple more <laughs> have you ever started a space cleanup who started a space cleanup is that the question have, has you have you ever started the space well have you ever um the u.s government is really working towards it so that's a great question um, one of my other side projects at the moment is cleaning up space um so i'm really i'm really excited about this because we really need to do something. Um, the trash situation is getting so bad out there that we're having trouble launching new things because every time we launch something, it has to go through this trash field. And so the more trash we make, the harder it's gonna be for us to launch things. And so we really have to start cleaning it up. And there are so many ideas out there on how to do this. Um, US government is putting money towards uh, thinking about these ideas. So you can think of, you know, simple ideas like nets. You can use a big net to capture things, right? But a net will only capture maybe a few things and then you got to launch another net again. So uh, it's expensive. Um, there are other ways to do it. Like you can, um, you can move or you can dock with old satellites and push them um, into the earth so that they can burn up on reentry. That's another way you can do it. Um, People are also thinking of um, destroying the trash using lasers, for example. You can you can heat it up till it turns into really small pieces of trash that then then doesn't damage, you know, other satellites as badly. Um, you can also there's also a really crazy idea that's been proposed where you send up a satellite that sprays uh, foam, kind of like silly string, at these pieces of trash that then make them really, really big so that they will stick to other pieces of trash and then push that whole junky piece um, into re-entry. Um, so there's there's a lot of really cool ideas out there right now. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm hoping that we will uh, put more funding into cleaning up space for sure. Mm -hmm. We're kind of on the, the edge where people are starting to get really super excited about it. So um, Europe is, has got some proposals out there too. Yeah. And as some uh, colleagues of uh, Andrea have said in the chat, um, that, that might be a problem for y'all to solve in the classroom, right? So like all of y'all who are attending here today, I uh, think you continue to think about this, you know, what, how can we solve these things? And hopefully in the future, we'll see some of y'all helping solve this problem as, yes, as we continue. For sure. For sure.
question. Right? Yeah, no, no, I think we have one more person per question if we have time. Uh, yeah, we can do one more. Yeah, we'll do him. And actually, so we'll do, can we do this student? And then the, the girl in the pink, she's had her hand up and I want to get her. Yes, she seems absolutely. very eager. <laughs> and then we'll, we'll close out from there. How long has uh, the company that you work for, how long, is it, how long have they been working with NASA? Oh, okay. How long was the question? How long have we been working with NASA or how long have we been? Yes, around? how working with NASA. Oh, okay. Um, well, the Aerospace Corporation has been around since the 1960s, and we've we've always worked with NASA, so we're quite close with them. Um, so more than 50 years or so. All right, Emma, our last question of today. Uh, what kind of animals do like? What kind of animals eat uh, water bears? What kind of animals eat water bears? That's a really good question. I would guess that animals like fish and worms would eat tardigrades. Um, I yeah, I, I think probably mostly fish. I think that would be a great re research question for you to find out. <laughs> great questions, boys and girls. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thank you all for the, for the great questions. Um, so um, any last messages, uh, Dr. Shu, before we close out that you'd like to kind of pass along or closing thoughts and then uh, Jill can close us out from there uh, as we go on? No, I just want to thank you guys for having me. Um, I want to encourage all of you to keep keep thinking about science, keep exploring. Um, you know, I, I started here with an engineering degree, but now I do all sorts of different scientific uh, experiments. So. You're not limited in science. You know, wherever you start, you can you can kind of grow from there. Um, so yes, thank thank you all so much, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much, Dr. Shu. We really appreciate this wonderful presentation. I want to say a big thank you also to the D. Howard International Education Foundation, our, our partner um, in this rural STEM initiative, and a big thank you to Principal Bird and all the kiddos that. Frankfurt Elementary, and I think we have some Bowling Green Elementary students there too. So just thank you all so much for being here with us. We really appreciated being able to bring this presentation to you and thanks to our colleagues in the Aerospace Corporation.